Welcome to Hartlepool in England, where we're at the four-litre offshore powerboat World Championships, set against the backdrop of the new historic quay. It's the centrepiece of a multi-million pound redevelopment of the Hartlepool Marina Complex area. The event is a first for Hartlepool and a flag-waving exercise for the tremendous facelift and financial regeneration that has been masterminded by the Teesside Development Corporation. Ron Norman, chairman of the corporation, explains the reasons for bringing the world's high-tech offshore powerboat machinery to what has been considered a very traditional port. It's something that we can bring to the town. It promotes the town because it's obviously it's water-related, marina-related, and yet it's something that all the people in the town can enjoy and take part in. Uh, and you can see from the crowds that we've got here today, it's just tremendously exciting uh, sport, a lot of buzz about it. Of course, it goes a lot further than that because you have a tremendous marina development here, do you not? Well, we do. Um, and obviously, more than the marina development, we're trying to redevelop the whole of, of Hartlepool and get future investment into Hartlepool. But the first thing we have to do is to make people aware of the town and we have to make people aware of its natural advantages. And it's on one of the best harbours on the east coast of England. It's actually a very attractive uh, seascape very attractive location, we've got good uh, docking facilities, good port facilities, and the whole future of Hartlepool depends on how well we can exploit our geographic location, develop our port, and develop all of our water-related activities. Well, the port's certainly in focus this week. The event is truly international, with entries from as far away as the UAE in the Middle East and South Africa. But the front runners should come from much nearer home, as favourite John Miller explains. Well, it has to be Neil Holmes. Every time he enters, he has to be a threat. Um, the finished boat looks very good. Mark Mulvaney, I know, is um, somebody that if he makes it all the way around, probably will be at the front. But Steve Hall, again, he's got a very fast boat that would have won two years ago um, in different ownership, albeit, but still would have won. There are any number of people. Oh, it's not going to be a pushover, then. I hope not. As, as, long as, as long as they move over, I don't really want it to be a pushover. And note, the one man on top of John Miller's list, four times world champion, Britain's Neil Holmes. He certainly won't be a pushover. Yes, we've got a good chance. We've got a new boat. Looking forward to trying it in four-litre format. Very interesting. Right. And across uh, for you, Jim, uh, it's going to be quite a difficult course. It's a complicated one, to say the least. Yes, there's some uh, long legs we've got to do and uh, never raced in the North Sea before. Quite big swells. I expect the boys will be hidden in the swells and things like that, but uh, quite sure we'll get round eventually. And the Finnish team also come with much pedigree. Their boat is immaculately prepared and arrives boasting a string of successes. Last year we broke the world speed record in 4 litre and 109.75 uh, miles per hour. So. And your European four-litre well, champion? Yeah, well, four-litre champion in uh, Norway, Arendal, last year, so... Right, OK, and your boat's much bigger than the rest. Uh, do you think it will suit the conditions? Yeah, I think uh, it will be fit very nice in this rough weather, like uh, today, so... We are very pleased with our new boat, so... <laughs> Good, and uh, you feeling confident? Yeah, we are feeling. I like the weather course today because uh, we have very good acceleration on our boat and uh, quite nice top speed, too. Top Frenchman is Jan Cadere, who's actually confined to a wheelchair, but he doesn't let that dampen his enthusiasm or his performances. We have finished uh, fifth two years ago in Beyonce, oh, yeah. and maybe we hope to do a better place now. <laughs> <laughs> now the conditions today are going to be quite rough. Does that suit your boat? Uh, maybe it is not uh, the best sea for our boat. It is too small like the other driver, like the other boat. and. Uh, we try to do our best. Representing Norway's Vidal Runes, no stranger to these shores, and a popular competitor, as well as a national champion. We have been out testing. We've been there a week before the race, so uh, I think this water will suit us very good. Are you telling me you got here early to get some extra practice in? Some extra practicing and uh, some repairs of the engine. We have changed engines, so uh, we, d we have been done a lot of work. Yeah. So you think you've got an advantage over everyone else? I think I know the course quite well now, so, <laughs> so maybe, maybe yes. And Jeff Purves is one of Britain's all-time offshore powerboating stars, many times national and European champion, but has never cracked world honours. It's something we've never won, and I'm out to win it this year for sure, and I'm going to try my hardest. <laughs> uh, how well prepared is the boat? 
Boat's superb now, engine's going really well, um, it's all up together. The only thing that bothers me is slightly small, it's 25 feet, and it's going to be rough down here, I think. It's a pretty hot competition. There is, I mean, uh, John Miller in the bat boat, that's very quick. I know that to be fast in the rough, and uh, Neil Holmes as well. We haven't raced against him in England yet, and he's going to be very hard to beat. But there's no doubting the media stars of this championship. After more than 20 years in the wilderness, it's good to welcome South Africa back to the fold. We're all very excited to be back. Um, you know, South Africa has been racing for years, unofficially down there in, the, in our own waters. And now to come back to Britain uh, is a tremendous feat. And it's taken quite a lot of organization, of course, to get the crew here. Uh, well, from South Africa, shipping the boats, airline tickets, uh, money. Uh, but it, was, uh, it wasn't too bad. The Ukorba helped us. And, of course, the port authorities of Cape Town, Portnet, uh, sponsored the uh, air tickets and regalia, which, of course, takes a lot of the money away. Sure. You were saying that the boat, you felt, wasn't quite competitive for this four-litre world championship. Isn't that because of the absence from the world scene? I think that, uh, yes, uh, we haven't had that opportunity of seeing what's happening in the rest of the world. And uh, by coming, we now know what we have to do for the next time. But there were early problems for the team. A breakdown in practice left them little time to make the start line, as Mel Hawtrey explained. We have a problem with our motor right at this very moment. <laughs> So we hope it comes right. We've got another you know, hour to sort it out. Can you explain what the problem is? I don't know. Actually, uh, the motor's fine on five cylinders, not six. Seems to be something wrong with the one, one cylinder. But make it they did, and they joined the rest of the fleet to lock out, ready for the first heat of three, which will decide the new world champion for 1994. It proved to be a great competition. They're on the roll-up to the start, and we pick up the action with our race reporter, Peter Butler. So it's 16 teams then from seven countries sporting some 6,500 horsepower that line up behind the start boat. And for this first heat, eight laps, 94 nautical miles, it's the usual UIM start procedure. That's the yellow flag flying that brings them into line. And then when no one has an unfair advantage, up will go the green flag and the race for the first decisive first mark will be on. And there is the green flag, on goes the power and they're away. And in the centre there, D3, Neil Holmes makes a decisive first move. He chose his spot well. And in these sprint conditions, will now surely be favourite to make mark one ahead of the rest of the fleet. Well, he makes a decision there, takes off the port. Well, that is really quite strange. Surely that will take him far too east of where he needs to be. But perhaps not for us to disagree with the world's most prolific champion. Most of the pack, though, I say, agreeing with uh, our view on that. Much more westerly tack, and surely that has to be the correct route. Well, Mark Mulvaney, D8, is in the group with Holmes, and some confusion here, and they certainly aren't sure. Still discussions going on there in that boat, you can clearly see. And there is the position. Now they must surely know they're wrong. That mark clearly in the top left-hand corner of your screen. And while, well, yes, they do now turn at last, but that slight error by the uh, early leaders will surely cost. And there is the cost. Holmes down from first to seventh, and Mulvaney right behind. So there's work already for some of the favorites to do. And out front go the teams that got it right, led by Stephen Hoare and co-driver Jeff Lowcock. And an early indication, too, that conditions may be favouring the monohulls. And further proof, Alan Butters and Chris Andrews joining Hoare. What a great start, then, for Great Britain. And right behind them, a great start, too, for France. Jan Cadaret, just behind the leading pack. But moving back down, uh, this is the Italians. And those North Sea swirls definitely not suiting the rubber boat. That looks hard work. Trouble two here for Colin Stoneman. We understand that he was uh, swamped at the start. Well, whatever, this looks disastrous. Back, though, uh, with the leaders uh, and on the run in at the end of lap one, we're looking at the flying fins. And I believe they've gone up from fifth to second. Their American skater cat powered by two 2.5 fuel-injected mercury outboards. Right on song here. Well, the ground speed on our helicopter is 82 miles per hour. Well, and that's the sort of level you're going to need to be at if, uh, if you're going to win here. 
but it's not going to be the Finns that get to the mark first. That honour is going to be taken by pre-race favourite John Miller. Well, that was a stunning lap from the Brit. He came from fourth or fifth position at the start. He's passed the other monohulls with plenty to spare. And now begins to justify that money placed on him before the start. He crosses the line now. And there's the gap. Oh, and that's a good solid start for Alan Butters, holding off the challenge from uh, Neil Holmes. He's in third. There's Holmes in fourth. An incredible uh, recovery there after that uncharacteristic walkabout. So that shouldn't leave Mulvaney. There he is in fifth, still trailing Holmes after he, too, misjudged the navigation to mark one. And coming through in ninth, that's the South Africans in a boat designed for much bigger seas than this. That's good going. Then behind them, uh, the South Africans. Looks like problems, though, for a humid back heat. Difficult to say what, but this is well off his top speed of around 90. And we're back with Miller at the front. And if it's humid at the back, it's certainly hotting up at the front. And there's the reason. The Finns have pulled alongside Miller. This is now over 90 miles per hour on the uh, ground speed of the helicopter. And you can see this is developing into some battle. Both drivers claiming before the race they were more interested in consolidating points and winning the first heat. And I'll tell you, these pictures tell a totally different story. But now he's got company in the shape of three times four-litre world champion Neil Holmes. So it's still all to play for as we pick up the action on the final lap. Miller then, with less than three miles to go now, who will surely take this first heat and reward for his faith in Oki Manapel's radical monohull. Nicknamed the Bat Boat because of its revolutionary wings, it certainly created much dialogue amongst the critics and skeptics at the beginning of uh, the season with this World Championship coming up. But uh, this is certainly the way to answer all that. So Miller it is then. Just uh, one mark to go and then the run in at the straight. He's round the mark. And this is the last quarter of a mile. The look over the shoulder shows that Holmes is now probably in excess of a quarter of a mile adrift. So this really is a great success. And the celebrations begin already on the back boat. John Miller in the front, Adrian Jardine in the back. 400 points is theirs. What a great start for them. And that great start gives them a 100-point lead over the team they expect to be their toughest rivals. They'll be pleased with that. But before that clip broke on the driver's hatch, the Finns had shown menacing promise, so they can't be ignored. Cadere are battling fourth, despite totally unsuitable conditions, but only seven finishers, testament to a rough race in which everyone had problems, including the winners. It was very rough, actually, and it was raining, which, uh, down at the far end, which didn't help either. Couldn't see a thing, and it was like bullets hitting in your face. <laughs> if you open your visor, have a quick peek. But um, we went the right way, which was a stroke of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Oh, you better explain that, Adrian Jardine. <laughs> well, the compass is an electronic compass, and it was faulty right from the word go. Um, it just automatically kept switching itself off, so we were navigating off the headlands and things like that. And then further in the race, the compass broke away from the boat, so I had to hold it through the race. So, effectively, we had no compass. We had nothing to navigate by all the way through the race. Mm, yeah, but if they thought they had problems, had what about Steve Hoare and his dramas? We were running quite well, really. Uh, boats run nice and level, and then we hit the one that didn't like us. We went up and up, and then as we came down, I almost knew there was one to trip us underneath, so I'd already gone under the cockpit. I actually had my head on the steering wheel because I knew I was going under. Kept my foot down, and I just hoped that Jeff would be all right in the back because he's even more exposed than I am. And keeping my foot down actually got the thing back up again. It did actually come up like a Nautilus-class submarine, as you say. <laughs> Well, you don't get luckier than that, but it was to be unlucky for those who'd suffered any breakdowns in the first race. Out of the North Sea came a ferocious storm that looked as though it put an end to running even one more race, let alone two, and that would virtually put an end to those crew's chances. But it wasn't enough to keep a royal visitor away, and she was especially pleased to welcome the South African team, sharing a few moments of chatty diversion that gave all the teams something a little cheerier to think about than the drizzle-laden skies around them. But on the final scheduled day of racing, the gods smiled, the wind dropped, and there would be a second race necessary to decide the world champion after all. All hands on deck and everyone gearing up for another rough race. But the conditions had flattened out somewhat, which would suit the cats. But there was still the unpredictable swell left by the storms, and that would catch out the unwary. As we find out, as we join the action on lap one with race commentator Peter Butler. And so after two miles, it's the Italians in front, but I have to say at times it looks precarious. And nothing quite so dramatic from Holmes, though. A look in his mirrors tells him second will do nicely. 
Behind him, it's the Finns that pose a threat, not Miller. And if it stays that way, Holmes will pick up his fifth world title. And there's still no sign of Miller. Oh, but there he is. Now then, is that fourth or fifth? It's fifth because there's Mulvaney on the left. Well, there's plenty for Miller to think about here. Early stages, of course, but he knows he's the target man. He must get past Mulvaney. Mulvaney on the inside, just out of shot, approaching the mark. There he is. Oh, and Miller's got through. Well, that will certainly give him a tonic and one that he needs. Just three in front now. Here's the gap. And no sign of the Italians. That looks to be... That's Holmes, but no wash from the Italians. So uh, we'll try and pick up on that very shortly. Great shot of the leaders there. Holmes uh, probably in front, possibly in front here. The Finns second and Miller third. I've still no sight of the Italians. But the reality still for Miller is, if he stays here, it's runner-up. So back with the South Africans, a much better day for them. This is six, and conditions the tough men of the Cape will relish, I'm sure. Oh, they were a long way up there, and that hurts, but they love it. Pulling in close now on the South Africans, the big boat well suited to this. Oh, once again going very high. More evidence that uh, back problem's the biggest problem for offshore power boat drivers, and there's the Italians. Well, they went missing. No question about that, but they were pushing it all the way, pushing it too hard, and the rib's gone. So Holmes is where he wants to be. He then definitely leads. It's the Finn second, and it's Miller third. Oh, and there's Mulvaney's pulled into third, so Miller goes back to fourth. Well, this is turning out to be a disastrous afternoon for the first heat winner. And Mulvaney is moving through. Well, this was the boat that won the World Championship in 1992 in the hands of Neil Holmes. Well, perhaps Neil Holmes here is regretting selling it because uh, his lead now under threat. Oh, and Mulvaney is through. Holmes is now in second. Well, I wonder what's going through Neil Holmes's mind. It's not nice to be looking at the boat you just sold in a World Championship bid. Finn third, Miller fourth. No good to Miller whatsoever. We're back then with Vidar Runes. He moves into fifth. Well... Well, the Norwegian there having to fight to, to control the boat. One engine on his boat compared with two on the rest, so he was uh, up against it, slightly less horsepower, but again, used to these conditions. This is uh, just the way they drive in Norway. This is Purvis. Now, he's got past Cadere, I suspect, once more. There he is. Cadere moves down to seventh. Right, we're back with the leaders. Esso Ultron, the boat of the Finns, D44. That's the three-way battle because in front of him is D4. So Miller is back. Miller has got past the Finns. Has he got past Holmes and Mulvaney? That's the question, because third, if Holmes wins, is no good to Miller. But here, Holmes is second, and is that is good enough for Miller. Holmes will pick up 300 points, giving him a total of 600. 225 from Miller behind him would give him 625, and victory by 25 points. So delicately balanced as Holmes gingerly takes the mark into that uh, into the swells. There the evidence that Mulvaney still leads. It's Holmes second, and it's the Finns who have come through on the inside of Miller once again. So Miller has dwindled yet another advantage in this championship. Well, he really is riding his luck here. Tries to pull through on the inside, but he's let the Finns through once more, and that at the end of this race could cost him very dearly indeed. And the Finns are pulling away just a little. Oh, well, John Miller and Adrian Jardine, again, with plenty to think about. Vidar Runes tightens up his position in fifth, ready to pounce, should the rest start to fail. And six still for the South Africans. They're going to be absolutely delighted with that in uh, D31 Portnet. They came here to do well, and doing well they are. Seventh it is then, so is the Cadaray getting past Purvis. There's Purvis. No purpose, letting it slip again. But uh, this is the man everyone's watching. John Miller came here with uh, also great hopes, like the South Africans, but his hopes very much on victory. Well, he looks to have got into second. No sign of a third boat there. Now, is that Mulvaney ahead? He certainly got past the Finns. Oh, and there is Mulvaney. Well, as in the first heat, big problems uh, for the Briton. And once again, that looks terminal. Well, that puts Holmes in the lead. 
Uh, that, of course, that's where he needs to be, but it still won't give him the championship if Miller remains in second. Well, there's very little Holmes can do about that. He really has uh, conducted the race that he said he would, that he would go to the front, he would get the points, and uh, leave it up to Miller to finish uh, in second position. Well, that's exactly where Miller is. And uh, looking comfortable, out of your shot, the Finns now about uh, 100 metres behind. As uh, Holmes comes across the finishing line, then he's going to take the 400 points, no question about that. And it'll be uh, Miller rounding the mark first, who's going to take second position and 300 points, which will give him the championship. But as far as the Finns are concerned, this isn't over yet. That was some burst round that final mark. They've come to within 25 metres, even less now of Miller's transom. Well, Miller's got to keep the power on here, otherwise he's going to lose this. And through the Finns come. Well, that's a mighty burst at the end of this race. It's going to be a dead heat. In fact, the Finns have gone through on the last minute. And I believe that has probably robbed Miller of the championship. Well, after everyone's pulses had calmed down, it was Holmes who found himself the new world champion. In just 100 metres, Jardine's mood had gone from delirious to depressed. We would have liked to have won it, but we didn't. Not start. Perhaps if we'd have driven, if we'd have gone harder, they might not be as close. But as the race went on, the conditions calmed off a little bit, and the cats were able to uh, trap air. So off they went. In a word, how'd you feel, John? <laughs> In a word that you can put on television. <laughs> <laughs> All of us, the whole team, we stuck our neck out. Plenty of work got here done it very pleased we did everything we had to do we got across the line first but then it was up to the uh, finish guys to help me out they certainly did that well that's it from Teesside and from the water sports world team see you next week